And uh, we're going to go through this chart, and uh, then we're going to match these dates up with this other sheet uh, with the chart. So you might want to take some notes or not because there's, I have a lot of detail here with these dates. But I want to explain the chart, and uh, <clears throat> this is really the layout of Scripture. So I want you to uh, be aware of uh, uh, this incredible book that God has given us. This is, this is an incredible layout, divinely inspired, even the structure of it, as you're going to see tonight. So if you look at the bottom left, you see that? Or the whole bottom there where it says Old Testament. This is the layout of the Old Testament. Now, if you'll notice that the, the subtitles under Old Testament, there are 17 books of history. There are five books of the inner life or experience. And there's 17 books of prophecy. Isn't that interesting that it is laid out so neatly? Well, it gets even better than that. Because if you look under history, there are five books of the basic law, pre-exile records nine, post-exile records three, and guess what? That matches the prophecy side too. F five basic prophets, nine pre-exile prophets, and three post-exile prophets. And I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But that's the layout of Scripture. It's just mind-boggling how cool that is. So what I did in my Bible was I took my Bible and I put a dot in the index right next to each one of these. And I'll show you how I did that. Um, one more page over here. Uh, I counted down five. So the first, if you look at the left, basic law, there's five books. So I went down one, two, three, four, five, and I drew a line. Then it says nine books. I counted down nine, and I drew a line. And then it says uh, th uh, three. I counted down three more, and I drew a line so that I know what books we're talking about here based upon this chart. Okay? Now, first of all, let's talk about the basic law. Now, the basic law is really the first five books of the Bible. Now, the first five books of the Bible uh, we will call... Uh, by several different names. If you're Jewish, you're going to call it the Pentateuch or the Law of Moses. Or if you're in the New Testament, you're going to say it's Moses because Moses wrote the first five books. To us, we're going to call it the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the Basic Law because this really is all that they had uh, during this time uh, for years and years and years and years and years. That's all the scripture they had. And the Jews today would call it the Torah. This is the Torah, the first five books. So if you're going to be Torah observant, you're going to follow the first five books of the Bible. Now, uh, the message of the first five books of the Bible is really the message of the entire scripture. Because the first thing you see in Genesis, you have the fall of man. In Exodus, you have redemption through the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, you have fellowship with God on the ground of the sacrificial altar. In uh, Numbers, you have a uh, divine guidance and you have a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day as Moses was leading them. In Deuteronomy, you have a final destination, a resting place. And that's the message of Scripture. The fall of man, the redemption of man, uh, fellowship with God, divine guidance, and the final destination. That's the scripture. That's the whole total message. So as they were doing this then, uh, this would become all that they really had to follow. Now we know, and based on the, 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 the dates now, I'm going to look at the chart, that the first date that we know that is accurate is 2186 B.C. That's Abraham's birth date. So just for your information, if you're going to... Um, uh, put things in uh, uh, date perspective, you can go to 2186 B.C. and you can say that's when Abraham was alive. But that's not all that was going on in the world. Back in those days, uh, we were talking about the China, Chinese dynasties. And uh, so uh, like that. And what was going on in India and things all around the world. So you can actually match that date with secular history to see what was going on in other places of the world. Now, since uh, Moses, and by the way, look at the next date on here. In 1441 B.C., we have the Exodus. Now, if you remember, and we'll talk about this a little bit, 
that uh, Joseph led the children of God down into Egypt. And uh, so Joseph was obviously before, Ab um, sorry, before Moses. Moses led them out of Egypt after 480 years of captivity in Egypt. So if I'm going to say 480 years on to 1441, then we're talking well, somewhere around 1900 B.C. Uh, was when Joseph would have taken them down into Egypt. I'm adding because we're going away from zero. We're going B.C. and so it goes like that. So in 1441 B.C., Moses led them out of Egypt. Now, we know what happened. You saw the movie. They were, uh, they were on the mountain uh, getting the, uh, the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but the whole entire law. Moses was on top of the mountain 40 days. While he was up there, the people of God were down at the bottom, and they were wondering, where in the world's Moses? I mean, good night, he's been gone 40 days. This guy led us out here in the wilderness. Now what? And they had been in captive for a long time, four centuries, almost five centuries. And by that time, they were being oppressed in Egypt. Uh, they, the, the Pharaoh got nervous because there were so many of them. They were multiplying like rabbits. And what if the enemy comes? They'll conquer us from within and make an allegiance with these Hebrews. And then where will we be? And so... Uh, uh, they, uh, they were severely enslaved and oppressed, and they were delivered out of Egypt by Moses in 1441 B.C. So in 1441 B.C., he went up to the top of the mountain. While he was up there, his brother Aaron, they said to Aaron, you know, we don't know if he's coming back. I mean, that's a long time. You're, that's over a month. It, we don't know where this guy is. He went up the mountain. Is he dead? Is he alive? I don't know. And so we want you to make us a God because we're used to having gods. So Moses, or Aaron said, well, all right, you know, I don't know about this, but I will. Give me all your gold. And so he made this calf of gold. You saw the movie. So now what are they reminded of? The gods of Egypt. Because that's for the last four centuries, that's all they've known was the gods of Egypt. And so now here they are worshiping this golden calf. Moses came down. He was all ir irritated by that. And he uh, uh, th threw the tablets down. You maybe you saw the movie. And the tablets broke. And he cursed the people. He ground up the golden calf, poured it in the water, made them drink the water. <laughs> he said, you want to have gold? You can have it in your, you can have it in your system. So in 1441 B.C., they started this journey out in the wilderness heading for the promised land. So they're coming out of Egypt. They had to cross the Red Sea. They had to go up the Sinai Peninsula, if you will, which is frankly only about a 60 to 90 day journey. But it took them 40 years to do it. And the reason it took them 40 years is this. You can get Israel out of Egypt, but you can't get Egypt out of Israel. It was in their hearts, and the Egyptian ways were in their thoughts and in their systems, and even their physical appetites uh, were Egyptian. So they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until they actually, um, uh, that, uh, the, most of the generation had passed off the scene so that the younger people were left so that God could start over with a monotheistic worship of God instead of all the idols in Egypt. So in, if they were in the wilderness 40 years, check the chart out, that means that in 1401 B.C. they entered Israel because they were 40 years. See that? All right, so now here they are in Israel. Now here's another date that's important to us, and the date is 1000 B.C. Because in 1000 B.C. David as the second king of Israel, and they lived under uh, theocracy for that period of time. Theocracy meaning there was a man of God, and he intervened with them and God. Uh, they were prophets. Uh, there were uh, judges, and there were priests and all that kind of system, but no king. And they finally got a king, and his first king's name was Saul, and Saul was succeeded by David. So David was around 1000 B.C., and we know that that's when David wrote most of the Psalms in that era around 1000 B.C. 
So now we're thinking ourselves that Scripture, when you're reading the Psalms, you're reading something that was written about 1000 B.C. So it's interesting to get these things uh, sort of in perspective. Now something happened uh, in uh, 950 B.C. In 950 B.C., the kingdom was divided. Now let me tell you what happened there. Uh, Saul, or uh, David's successor, was his son Solomon. Solomon had a son whose name was uh, Rehoboam, and he became the king of Israel when Solomon passed off the scene. Now, something happened during Solomon's reign. Uh, he spent, um, he decided that he was going to build the temple. So they didn't, never had a temple yet. So now we're going to build a temple. They had sort of a portable deal that they could follow around for 40 years. But now they're in the promised land. Now they're in Jerusalem. Now they're where they ought to be. So we need a temple permanent. So Solomon built a temple. And it took him uh, f seven years to build this temple. Now he, it's built of all kinds of cool wood and, and gold. and I mean overlay. So where do you think he got the wood? Well, he got it from the people. Where do you think he got the gold? Well, he got it from the people. Well, where do you think he got the laborers? Well, he did it from the people. And by that time, they had an army. Where do you think they got the army? From the people. So the whole thing was a taxaholic institution because they just taxed them brutally. Well, when Solomon, uh, Solomon got done building the temple in his seven years, he said, well, you know, I built a house for God. I think I'll build myself a house. So he built himself a house. And guess how long it took to do that? Thirteen years. So ha twice the time that he built God's house, he built his own house. Of course, the same taxing went on and the same people and the same slavery and the, the same oppression uh, that, the, that there was in all this taxation, you see. And by the way, if you're into biblical numerics, the number 13 is the number of rebellion. And it took him 13 years to build his own house. He passed off the scene and his son Rehoboam shows up. So now they don't know how to succeed. It must be the line of succession. You have a father. If he's got a son, he's even the next king. If he's got a son, he's even the next. Well, that's just their own thinking. That's the way it worked, even though that wasn't necessarily God's plan for all that. So Rehoboam uh, took counsel of the some of the younger people and he said, you know, what do you think we should do here? You think we ought to keep the taxes up like this? And, and they said, oh, yeah, man, put the hammer down. You know, these people, got they, they, we need to tax and spend, right? So the older people came to Rehoboam, and uh, they said, you know, if you just lighten up a little bit, you know, and just lower the taxes, and, and uh, th these people will love you. They'll follow you. And so he thought about it for a while, and he said, nah, I'm going to put the hammer down. So he increased the taxes. He said, whatever Solomon's tax has been, it's going to be like the weight of a little finger compared to what I do. So he put the hammer down. Well, now along came a politician named Jeroboam. And Jeroboam said to the people, you know what? Uh, this taxing is ridiculous. If you come follow me, I will lower taxes. I will give you stuff. And that's the way you get elected, by the way. Just promise to give people stuff. And so I'll give you free cell phones or whatever you want. You know. So he, uh, he promised to uh, lighten the load. So the people said, you know, that kind of that sounds good to me, you know. And, and so as it turned out, there were 12 sons of Israel, right? 12 sons of Jacob, these all became the 12 tribes of Israel. When they entered the promised land, they entered in their own little tribal community. So these southern tribes were uh, Judah and uh, uh, like that, and, and the northern tribes were, uh, were uh, uh, Asher and Nephthalim and, and uh, all the 12 tribes. So what happened was Jeroboam came along and he lured away... 10 tribes. So now we have the kingdom being divided. So the kingdom was divided under Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Now instead of just Israel, we have what we call the northern tribes and we have what we call the southern tribes. The northern tribes would take on the name of Israel and the southern tribes would take on the name of Judah. 
And that's uh, extrapolated out. That's where we get the name Jewish uh, from the tribe of Judah because Judah and Benjamin were the two southern tribes. So now we have 10 tribes on the north, two tribes on the south, and they weren't opposed to each other. They just lived in the land of Israel. But one day, Jeroboam, this guy, he said to himself, now listen to this, this is very important. He said, now Jeroboam said, now this is the king of the northern tribe, right? Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. And I'm in 1 Kings uh, 12, looking at verse number 26. He said, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people be turned again unto their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me, and they'll go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he's getting nervous. He says, you know what? These are religious people. The temple was in the southern kingdom. And these are religious people. They're used to visiting the temple. So he said, we don't have a temple up here. They're going to go back to the temple worship. And when they do... Rehoboam's going to win their hearts again. They're going to figure out they don't need me. They're going to kill me. So here's what he did. Whereupon the king took counsel and he made two calves of gold. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And he said to them, Oh, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold, these are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And they said, golden calves. Yeah, I remember something like that. And, and uh, in their oral history, they remembered this golden calf thing. And they remembered coming out of Egypt. So they said, yeah, that, okay, that makes sense. So he p made two golden calves. One he put in a place called Bethel, which, by the way, means house of God. And the second one he put into a place called Dan. It says, this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one, even to Dan. And he made a house of high places and priest of the lowest of the people, which were not the sons of Levi. Now, by this time, the tribe of Levi, Levi, but Levi were the priestly tribe. Their job was to maintain the temple. Uh, their job was to maintain all the worship thing. The rest of them did their own vocation, but the tribe of Levi, were the, were they were the priests. And so uh, he said, well, I'm going to need some priests. So what he's doing is he's trying to match their religion. They know about calves. He made some calves. They know about priests. So he, he created some priests. And it goes on to say, and Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth day of the 15th day of the month, like the feast that's in Judah. And he offered upon an altar. So now he said, yeah, they're used to altars, so we're going to have an altar. They need some feast days because they're accustomed to that. So I'll just, I'm going to counterfeit a religion. It said, and, uh, and the Jeroboam, uh, let's see, so what does it say? So did he at Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which made in Bethel the 15th day of the 8th month, even unto the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he ordained a feast unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. So that's the way religion worked. Now why do we have this other religion? Because this guy's getting nervous for his life. He did it for personal gain. It said, and the thing became a sin to the people. So what happened was he led them back into idolatry. He didn't care what their consequence was. It didn't matter to him what God thought of this. All he had one thing in mind, and that is my own personal interest. And that's the way religion starts. And there's, now we have two, and today we've got thousands. Because all you've got to do is be a charismatic kind of fella. You can start a religion, and you can gain a following. There's a classic illustration of how that works. So what happened was, uh, it goes on to say that uh, later on, when the kingdom was divided, that Jared, and I'm looking at the chart, in uh, 950, Jeroboam rules the northern kingdom. He invents religion. In 721 B.C., the northern kingdom went into captivity in Assyria. I'm going to look at this thing here. 
So what happened was God said this is idolatry. And God had already told the people in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Numbers. He said, look, if you behave yourself, I'm going to bless you. I'll bless your land. Man, it's going to be milk and honey. Uh, but if you don't, then I'm going to curse your land. And I'm going to curse you if you don't behave yourself. So what happened was this thing became a sin and the northern kingdom, God raised up the nation of Assyria and brought them in and they conquered the nation, the northern kingdom, the nation, what we would have called then Israel. So they took them off into Assyria into captivity in 721 BC. Now in 606 BC, the southern kingdom and now the, ne the next uh, national or uh, global power was Babylon. So in 606 B.C., the southern kingdom, even though they had their religion, and even though they had the temple, and even though they had the priest, and even they still went into idolatry. They couldn't help it. So they went off into captivity in 606 B.C., and they were taken off into Babylon. In 586 B.C., this... Uh, Finally, Jerusalem itself is sacked by the Babylonians. So now we have, guess what, the captivities. So now if you go back to your chart, these are exile records. See that? So now we have nine books that are history books written about the exile and telling us exactly why God allowed this to happen. Now, if you look one more step down on your explanation sheet, it says in 536, the southern kingdom went back to Israel or Jerusalem. So the southern kingdom was allowed to go back, southern kingdom named Judah. They were allowed to go back in 536 B.C. Now, we know that this is called the 70 years captivity. So the 70 years captivity, they were gone. Guess what year that would have been that they went into captivity? 606. Take 70 off of that and you get 536. So now they are back in the land. Now, if you'll notice the history on the bottom, we have five basic law, nine pre-exile history, and three post-exile history. So the prophets, they prophesied to these northern and southern kingdom until they were taken captive, you see. And then when they came back, the last three are after they came back. Now these prophets are prophesying after they, I'm sorry, th this is, a, I, I didn't mean the word prophecy. This is history about when they came back. History when they, were, when they left, history when they came back. Now, why do we need history? Well, you see, the the issue is with history, we need to see how God works with man. We don't know how he works with man until we see the history. So we look at the history and we see what pleases God. We see what ticks off God. We see what he blesses. We see what he curses. So we get to see how God operates and he is very, very consistent in his operation with man. So you can say to yourself, if I want to know how to get cursed, I'm going to do what they did. If I want to know how to get blessed, I'm going to do what they did when God blessed them. Really important as we look at the history. Now, the next thing that we see is there's five books of the inner life. Now I'm going back to my index in my Bible and I'm going to read to you what those five, five books are because this is not history. This is what should be going on in our own minds and hearts. This is how we think. So the five books are the book of Job. What's going on there? That's how people think. That's how Job's reacting. The book of Psalms, that's what David thought. The book of Proverbs, that's the book of wisdom about what you should think about. Uh, Ecclesiastes, that's Solomon uh, spinning out his wisdom. And the book of the song. So this is all about what you think and what your inner life is like, what your thought life should be. So now we have history, and not only history, but what you should think about history and how you should behave in your own mind and heart. And so we have five books now right in the middle of the Old Testament that tell us how to think. Now we go to the book of the prophets. 
And just like with the uh, history, we have five basic prophets. We have nine pre-exile prophets. And we have three post-exile prophets. So the prophets were telling the people. Now, j just guess what, what they would have been saying in a pre-exile setting. In a pre-exile setting, they would have been saying to the people, turn or burn. You got to get right. If you don't get right, you're going to get left. Uh, you got to get your heart right, man. You got to stop this idolatry. You got you, you to behave yourself. And not only at the local setting, but there's also prophecy that deals with us in the future. So there's always more than one level when you get to prophecy. It's the local interpretation, and then there's a future interpretation. Now we know that uh, there are 1,000 prophecies concerning the Messiah that would have been given during this time and uh, telling us all about what to expect when the Messiah came or Jesus. So now we have, and look at the layout, how cool that is. And by the way, when you get to the last book of the post-exile, now we're talking about the book of Malachi. And I just want to read a little bit to you about Malachi because here's what went on. And it says this, this says the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And he's talking almost as if he's in the first person. This is God talking. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, well, wherein have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? And you, yet you say, I loved Esau and I hated Jacob and laid his mount. I mean, you haven't loved us. And he goes on to say, and the priests have despised my name. And they said, where have we despised your name? What are you talking about? He said, you've polluted You've offered polluted bread upon me, my altar. Where have we polluted you? What are you talking about? So God's making these accusations against these folks, and they've got it all wrong, and they won't, they won't admit to it. So they have fallen so far away from God during this time that finally between the Testaments, Old and New Testament, another 400 years. This time it's 430 years. So 430 years, guess what? No priest, no prophet, no word from God. What's going on here? Don't know. Is God still alive? What's happening? And during that time was the time that we know in contemporary history as uh, uh, the Greeks and the, and the Romans took over world control. This is when um, a Constant, uh, not Constantine, but Alexander the Great ruled the world. This is when uh, Homer wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. This is when uh, the Peloponnesian Wars took place and um, uh, Spartans and all that, all that kind of stuff. And the Greek philosophers, okay? So that's between the Testaments. Something ha else happened between the Testaments, and that is that the Jews developed their own religions. Now, if you leave people alone, they're going to make a religion. And what they did was, instead of returning to God, instead they made denominations. So now they've got the, they've got the Pharisees, and they've got the Sadducees, and they've got the Zealots, and they've got the Essens, and they've got the Herodians, and all these guys that can't get along. They made their own little denominations. So now here they are. When Jesus showed up, these people were all fighting religiously, which is what religion does. It makes people fight. It never draws people together. It only pushes people apart, period. That's the way that works. So now, go back to the chart. We have now... Oh, and by the way, if you want to know... Look, I'm, I'm just... Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to grab my Bible and I'm going to look here... Here's the book of Daniel, okay? And when was that written? 607 B.C. Now go look at your chart and tell me what was going on in, uh, in and around that time. And these dates are none of them perfect. But Daniel's now off in captivity in Babylon. He was taken to captivity. Well, that, that equals the chart, you see. So now we're in that era so you can see what's going on in the world. And they went off into captivity, you see. So where, what's going on here is, this is cool, this is very cool, he allowed 
this uh, diaspora, it's called, the deportations, he allowed this to happen so that these people taken slaves, these monotheistic Jews, would salt the known world with a monotheistic God. Here they are, that's in their heart. They only believe in one God, the real one, and here they are out in the known world now, becoming salt and light to people which is way cool. You can't plan this, but this is God pulling this whole thing off here. Now, we'll see how it comes to a head in a minute. Next thing we have on the chart is, now we're going to the New Testament. If you look at the bottom here, it's got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. So now we're building another foundation. And why do we have a new foundation? Because God's acting differently now. In the uh, Old Testament history, we see how God acts Listen, look at uh, with man. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's going on? God is acting as man. What a cool thing now. Because a plan is afoot if you can see this thing coming together. So in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, each one are written to different people for with a different mindset. Matthew's written to Jews. And if you look in Matthew chapter 1, uh, it's got a genealogy. It says this is a, the genealogy of uh, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, and these are all Jews. So it goes and shows the lineage of, the, of Jesus. Why would he do that? Because he's declared by Matthew as the king of the Jews. Kings have to have a lineage. When we get to the book of Mark, it's written to somebody different. It's written to Romans. And with the Roman mindset, it depicts Jesus as a servant or as a slave. And uh, slaves and servants, they don't need a genealogy, so there's no genealogy in Mark. When you get to Luke, Luke is written to the Greeks, and it depicts Jesus as the perfect man. And you know the Greeks and the statues and how obsessed they are with the perfect man form and all that. Well, Luke was written to Greeks. But when we get to the Gospel of John, it was written to the world, saying, declaring him to be the Son of God. So now we have a different look for each one, and it's important that you know that, because in one of the Gospels, it's going to say that he was crucified the third hour. In another Gospel, it's going to say he was crucified the sixth hour. And you say, uh-oh, that's wrong. No, it depends on whose clock you're looking at. You know, which time zone you're in. If you're a Greek, you're going to th you see it differently than you are if you're a Jew. Because Jews, even the first hour of the day, to them, is 6 o'clock at night. So the whole thing changes uh, because of the emphasis and to, who, to whom it's written. Now we come to, and of course in the, in the, uh, the historic books, we see Jesus being uh, crucified. Now we come to the book of Acts. So what happens in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit descends. Okay, so now we've been talking about this for through the prophets that the Holy Spirit would come. And so now here comes the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to them in Acts chapter 1, <coughs> excuse me, in verse number uh, 8, it says, But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you're going to be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, interesting to note, Jesus said, hang around in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit's going to descend. He's not here. He's in me now. I have to go away so he can descend. When he does, you're going to find yourself witnessing. You can't help yourself. When the Holy Spirit gets in you, you're going to talk about Jesus. He said you're going to do it in Jerusalem and Judea. That's Jewish. You're going to find yourself in Samaria. That's cross-culture because now we have half-breed Jews, not purebred Jews, which is something that the Jews didn't like. And finally, the uttermost parts of the earth, that's the Gentile world. And the Jews certainly didn't like that. They considered Gentiles dogs. So he's saying to these Jewish people, this is what's going to happen. And then it says, and when, they had, when he had spoken these words, behold, a cloud 
uh, uh, they behold, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Wow, what's going on here, you know? And while they looked up steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, angels. And he said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So now we're talking about he's leaving, but here's another promise. He's returning. And so these angels are saying, okay, it's time for you to get busy. Because what's going on now? Now we're not talking about how God works with man, we're not talking about how God works as man, but we're getting ready to talk about how God works through man. Very cool. Now, verse chapter 2 of Acts, and this is important, it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, pay attention. Three things happened. Three supernatural things. Number one, rushing mighty wind. This is Indiana Jones style, right? Cloven tongues like fire. You've seen the Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, that, it looked like it was taken out of the Bible. So here's this fire zooming around, and, and they're going, whoa, what's going on here? Clearly something supernatural was happening. And it says, and they began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So now we not only know something supernatural is happening, but we know where the focus of it is. It's on these guys over here. So there's thousands of people here in Jerusalem, but when the word got around that something's going on, we know who to go see because these are the guys that are having the experience. Now in verse number five is a very, very, very cool verse. You got to know this verse. It says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Well, where were these guys doing out in every nation under heaven? These were the guys that were sent out during the dispersion. These are the 700 years ago. These are the guys that were salted in the known world. These are the guys that had the monotheistic notion. These are the guys that, that had a heart for God, even though they didn't like the fact that they were servants and slaves around the world. But now they came back for this pilgrimage into Jerusalem to celebrate a feast day, which is the Feast of Pentecost. And so here we are on this pilgrimage, and all of a sudden, something supernatural is taking place. First time it's done this, we've been coming to this thing for years, and now all of a sudden something's going on. Well, what is it that's going on? It says, now when, they, when this was noised abroad, what, when what was noised abroad? Something supernatural is happening. And we know where it's going on. These guys over here seem to be the focus of this whole thing. It said, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. What language? Well, the language of the country that they came from. You know, the, the mother tongue of their language. They've been there for 700 years. This is all they knew except they also knew the one, national, the one international language at that time was Koine Greek. Greek, Koine means simple. So they knew simple Greek, and the whole world knew simple Greek. And by the way, for the first time in world history, the Bible was written in the language of the common man, and it was written by a guy out of Egypt named Oregon, Origen. And he was, uh, uh, he, uh, he was Egyptian, and he wrote what we call the Septuagint, which was the Old Testament in Koine Greek, okay? And, uh, or, 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 I'm sorry, it was in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, so here's what happened. 
we hear every man speak in our own language. And they were amazed, and they marveled, saying one to another, Behold, aren't these men which speak Galileans? That's like saying they came from Riverview. You know, they don't, not very smart. Come on, John, pay attention here. I'm, I'm poking fun at you here. Right. And it says, How hear we every man in our tongue wherein we were born? So we know that this is not some kind of an unknown language. We know it's known. In fact, it says it three times because the third time comes up now. Verse 9, these are the languages of the Parthenians, the Medes, the Elamites, the dwellers of Mesopotamia, in Judea, Capodicea, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, do we not hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? So where do they come from? All of those places. And some of these, by the way, are cities. Some of them are regions. Okay, we know that, um, we know that um, uh, uh, Pontius is a city. We know that Asia is a region. We know that Mesopotamia is a region. So some of these are cities. Some of these are regions. But nevertheless... These were the languages that these men heard them speak in. So they're all, they can't figure this out, what's going on now. And they said, well, we, just don't, we don't know what's happening. So Peter then stood up and uh, he, verse 14, lifted up his uh, voice and he said unto them, you men of Judea and all you that dwell in Jerusalem. So we got the people that live there and we've got the people that are visiting, right? And be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, that these are not drunk as you had supposed, but it's the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now he's going to use the prophets to validate the experience. If you can't validate it with the prophets, it's, not, it's a non-deal. It's a non-starter. So uh, he's using the prophets to convince these people that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah. And we know what happened. That day, 3,000 people accepted the Lord. And uh, it, was a, it was a launching. It launched what we would call today the church. And uh, it wasn't complicated church. It was a simple church. It took us a while to get all screwed up, but we certainly did. And uh, today we have 41,000 Christian denominations because we can't get along. Leave us alone. We're going to fight. And that's just the way it is. So now we have, and I'm going to skip up now to the experience in doctrine on the chart. We have nine Christian church epistles. So if you're reading through, if you're counting down on your index in your Bible, you're going to count down after five, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, starting with six, the next nine, our Christian church epistles. In the middle, we have pastoral and personal. So this is written to people, not to groups. And in the last nine are what we would call Hebrew Christian epistles. So it's written to specifically the Hebrew mind. And so that's kind of the layout of Scripture. Now, um, here's what happened. I'm going to show you in Acts chapter number, and this is really history, God working through people, right? So in chapter 13, here's what happens. And if you look at my Bible here, I've got red marks every time I came to a city or a place. It says, now there was dwelling at, at, at the church in Antioch certain prophets and teachers uh, named Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. We just read about those two places. And, uh, okay. and it says, uh, and a guy named Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetra. So what I did was I took and I marked every place. So Antioch, guess what, isn't even in Israel. And we're about to send the first missionary, and it's going to be Paul and Barnabas. And they're not even in Israel now. They're in a church in a place just north of Israel that we would call today probably Lebanon or something like that. So it says, and they went to, they departed from Seleucia, and they sailed to Cyprus. Well, it's an island. We know where that is. And there they went to a place called Salamis, which is probably on the island, and Paphos, which is Greek, and uh, Pergia and Pamphylia. So I'm, I'm noting all these places where they went, you see. 
And uh, so I'm reading along. It says Iconium in chapter 13 and verse 51, in verse, uh, four, chapter 14 and verse 6, Lystra, Derby, chapter 14, verse 21, back to Lystra, Iconium, back to Antioch, Pisidia, Pamphylia, per uh, all, all these names. Now, we don't know these names. They're just places, right? But after a while, it gets kind of interesting because Paul takes a second missionary journey. And here's what it says. Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and he went through the cities. So he's, he's all going everywhere, right? And this is a long journey, by the way. And he went to a place called Phrygia and Galatia. Oh, that's interesting. I know that name. He went to this region uh, called Galatia. It's not a city. It's a region. Now, later, uh, so what he went there, he's, uh, it says, and they were preaching. And uh, like, so there's converts in this place called Galatia. So what happened? Well, later, he would, after he left there, he would write a book to these people. And we would know this as the book of Galatians. So he wrote this letter. It's called an epistle. An epistle is nothing more than a letter. So here's what he said to these people in Galatia. So let's see how they're doing, okay? So it says, uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there are some among you that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it doesn't sound like they're doing so good. You know, they've kind of fallen away, and it says, and, and uh, if any man to preach unto you any other, I want him to be a cur So it said, man, there's people among you, and they're telling the wrong story, and they're teaching it wrong, and preaching it wrong, and, 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 and so he's kind of rebuking them. All right, so I go back to the history now, and I see some other names. Mycia, Troas, Macedonia, Samothracia, Neapolis. Oh, there's one I recognize, Philippi. So he went to this place called Philippi. And what did he do? Well, I'm going to run over to the book of Philippians and see how that turned out. And uh, we're going to see what he wrote to these Philippians. And so now he's writing a letter back to these people. And uh, here's what he said, beginning in verse 3. He said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, it's, it sounds like he's happy with these folks. He's rebuking those people in Galatia. He's commending these people in, uh, in uh, Philippians. Later, he's going to go to a place called Thessalonica. He's going to write them a letter. Let's just see what he said to them, to the Thessalonians. And uh, he said, um, we give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you always in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of patience and your labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God, knowing, brethren, your beloved, your election of God. And he, so he's commending these people. You became followers in us, verse 6. Verse 7, you were example to everybody in Macedonia. Verse 8, you sounded out the word. Now, it sounds like he's commending these folks, you see. So when now he's taking these journeys and he's writing these letters back to these places and to these people, you see. That's what these are. These are letters. These are, we would call them epistles, but simply they're letters. Okay? So now we have the scripture, and if you look at it, look at the balance. Nine Christian church, four pastoral and personal, nine Hebrew Christian. I mean, that's just mind-boggling that this book is laid out such. I mean, this is written over a period of 1,400 years from some 70 different authors. And how in the world do they ever get this all together and agree on anything? You'd think they couldn't. But that's the scripture. That's God's word. And you can see the plan as it moves forward. And, and I got news for you. There's an end to the story. And he said Jesus is coming back. And when that happens, we're going to see what that looks like. And there's so much prophecy about that. And then the book of Revelation takes place and it kind of blows your mind. So what I'm saying is that's the way you approach the scripture. You've got to figure out what it is you're reading instead of just going like this and say, all right, let's see if there's a message here for me. 
Well, there, there is, yeah, but I just opened up to 1 Kings, and guess what year it is? This uh, 2 Kings, 721 B.C. Let me go to the chart. Oh, guess what happened in 721 B.C.? The northern kingdom was taken captive. So this is a history that would it, it show that experience, you see, in that era. So you can tell what's going on in the nation. It's so wicked that God lets them go into captivity just by knowing the date and how it matches the chart. You got it? So if I were you, there's a certain number of dates on here that I would remember. Okay, the first date I would remember is the first one, 2186 B.C. I would circle that. I would circle 1401 B.C. because that's when they came into the nation of Israel. I would do 1000 because that tells you when David was. I would get these next, the 721, 606, 5. I'd get those four down because those four really talk about the pre and the post exile, and you need to know how that works. And by the way, the 10 northern tribes never came back, only the two southern tribes. They're like that guy that got on the T the in Boston, you know. He never returned, no, he never returned. And, his fate is still, you know, that's, that's the song, the way that song goes. So uh, this is the chart, and that's the explanation of Scripture. And uh, if you know this chart and, and the, the, get the grasp of it, then you can figure out what's happening here in the Bible. And if you don't, you're just kind of shooting in the dark, hoping you can get things figured out. And uh, I wish I knew that when I was a kid. It took me all, half my life to figure it out. Mm -hmm.